very much for reminding us that God just wants our heart, right? Our love and our heart. That's all he wants from us. Uh, he'll take care of the rest. He'll take care of the rest. Amen? Thank you. It was very nice. And uh, it was great to hear some new people coming to our church and getting involved, right? That is great. I appreciate that, Vanessa. All right. This morning we're going to talk about missed opportunities. Have you ever missed a golden opportunity in your life? Oh, probably you have. I don't know a person that never had regrets, you know, about a missed opportunity. We all probably think, think back about those times and moments in lives when, with, you know, regrets and disappointment. And uh, we probably ask ourselves this question many times, why didn't I just do it? You know, why didn't I just take more risks at that time, right? Regrets, because we missed opportunities. Now, in the days before they built modern harbors, um, a ship had to wait for the flood tide before it could make it to the port, right? They didn't have harbors like they do today. And the term for this situation in Latin was ob portu. And you can hear the word opportunity there, right? Ob portu. And, and that meant that a ship standing off somewhere, off port, was waiting for a moment when the tide will come to ride the tide to come into the port. And so the English word opportunity is derived from this original meaning. A ship waiting for the opportunity, for the tide to ride the tide. So the captain and, and the crew were ready and waiting for that one moment, for they knew that if they missed it, um, you know, they have to wait for another opportunity to come later. So there is a, a very interesting quote by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and it says this, Look in my face. My name is might have been. <laughs> My name is might have been. I'm also called no more, too late, farewell. <laughs> I like this one because this is how we look at life, you know, sometimes. And there would be many might have been in our lives. It is no different in our spiritual lives. Uh, there are many might have beens when it comes to our spiritual experience. There are many Christians that miss golden opportunities and Today we're going to talk about one of those examples in the Bible. So I invite you to open again in 2 Kings. We're going to be in this story. It's an amazing story. You know, this is the last thing that Elisha does. He's on his deathbed, all right? And the king comes to him, and probably the king thought that Elisha is going to give him a huge speech and, how, you know, and everything like that. But it's very interesting what he actually asked the king to do, right? And so 2 Kings chapter 13 and we'll read now from verse 15 to verse 19. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on the bow, on it, and Elisha put his hand on the king's hands. This is a very important point here, all right? And he said, open the east window, and he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have dis uh, destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. So here, first he asked one arrow to shoot. And then he said, you will destroy the Syrians. Now he says, take all your arrows, everything you have. And, and he said, take the arrows uh, and, and shoot them. Uh, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Very, very interesting story. Probably you read it before. So let's see what's happening here in this story. Now, in here we see that the king didn't, missed a golden opportunity to defeat Syrians. He did not have enough faith to shoot all of those arrows in the ground. 
he stopped right in the middle. Now, Elisha didn't tell, me how, didn't tell him how many times to shoot. He just said, take all of the arrows. He just said the first time, shoot an arrow, all right? And the second time, he said, take, take your arrows and strike them in the ground. I think he implied, take all of your arrows and strike them in the ground. But the king stopped right in the middle of this action, and he did not go all the way to the end. King missed a great opportunity here. The question is, why did the king respond this way? Why did he not shoot? Why did he shoot only three arrows and not all of them that he had in his quiver? I have a few answers that I think, I believe that uh, why the king did that, and I'm going to give you the answers. You might have some more, and we can discuss those later, all right? But this is what I, I found. One of the answers is found in actually verse 8, 11. So go back to uh, chapter 13, verse 11. And it talks about the king here. Okay, and so the king here is Jehoash. And it says there in verse 11 that he did what? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Je Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel sin, but walked in them. So this was an evil king. And it's very interesting that God was willing to give a victory even to an evil king for the sake of his people, all right? He would overlook that and say, you would obtain complete victory over the Syrians. Despite the king's sinfulness, God had his plans for him and the nation of Israel. He had big plans for them. He had the plans for them to defeat the Syrians, which were always attacking them. Now, he would have given them the victory, that great victory over the enemy, even though they didn't deserve it, because they were not faithful to him. But the king was not dreaming as big as God. God had a huge plan, a big plan for them. God had a big plan, a big dream for the nation of Israel to obtain victory over their arch enemy, the Syrians. But the king didn't have as big of a dream as God had. It is likely that, this, that sin kept him from dreaming God's dream. And many times when we have the same worldview, we have this, we call it small-mindedness, very narrow-minded, that we don't have a big worldview, we don't see a big picture, we you can't see God's picture. When we have that, we are behaving like children because we are immature in our spiritual experience. We don't have enough trust in God to trust Him that He can accomplish. We can't see that big picture. Really, I can defeat the Syrians? I don't think I can do that. We don't really understand who God is and what He can do for us when we have that small thinking. We don't see God's picture. We don't see His big plan and big dream for us. But God says in Jeremiah that He does have a plan for us, doesn't He? He has a plan for every one of us and He will accomplish it. And when we have that small thinking, that narrow-mindedness, we can't see God's plan for our lives. We behave like children. We are immature in our spiritual experience. There was a a little girl once that came to her father and said, uh, Dad, can you please give me a nickel, right? It's a five cent, right? And, uh, and he looked into his pockets quickly, but he didn't have five cents, a nickel, and he, but he had only a $20 bill, all right? And he says, listen, here, I'll give you a $20 bill because I don't have five cents. I don't have a nickel. And she's like, no, but I want a nickel. And the father frantically tried to explain to her, he said, sweetie, I, I don't have a nickel, but here I have a $20 bill. And the father said, a $20 bill is so much bigger, so much more money. And he told her how many nickels can be in a $20 bill, all right? And the, the girl sweetly listened to her father and said, yes, daddy, that's great, but I still want a nickel. She didn't get it. And many of us are the same today. We are spiritually immature children. We don't get God's plan for us. He has a great big plan for us. He wants to bless us. He wants to give us a $20 bill. And we behave like children and say, no, 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 I want a nickel. That's what I want. Please give me what I want. I want my will, not what you want for my life. Spiritual immaturity. God wants to give us everything. 
We want our will so much that we miss out on God's perfect destiny for us. We miss on his will for us, which is so much more than $20 bill. <laughs> he wants to bless us abundantly. But because we have that small thinking, we have that narrow-mindedness, we don't understand God and what he wants for us and what he can do for us, we also behave like children, being spiritually immature. Spiritual immaturity leads us to take the easy way out, to always find excuses for not doing what God asks us to do. Most of us have con uh, constructed some pretty good excuses not to work for God. Even though he gives us gifts and he wants us to use those gifts for his glory, we come up with a lot of excuses not to use those gifts. That's small-mindedness. That is narrow-mindedness. That is when we are spiritually immature, we will find a lot of excuses not to serve God. We will say things like, oh, that's just not who I am. I don't have time. You don't know what I've been through. We tried that before. I don't want to get tied down. Have we heard those excuses before? Those are the people that are spiritually immature. They can't see the big picture of God like the king couldn't see here the big picture. And the prophet says, strike, don't stop. It will be yours, the victory. But he had doubts in his mind because he was spiritually immature. Let me read you a quote from Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 11, uh, 1896, Paragraph 39. Ellen White says this, Be ever ready to make the most of every presented opportunity for expressing your, uh, ex exercising your influence for the Master. From hour to hour in your varied life, these opportunities will open before you. They will be constantly coming and going. That opportunity of speaking in the hearing of some soul, the word of life, may never offer itself again. And then she ends with this. Therefore, let no one venture to say, I pray thee have me excused. Please excuse me, Lord. <laughs> I, I can't do that. We should never say that. God will always present opportunity to us. And we have to be spiritually mature, mature enough to respond and take and use those opportunities to, to serve God and preach the word of God. So why didn't King use that opportunity? He was spiritually immature. He didn't have enough faith. He was spiritually mature. And that brings us to the second point, the lack of faith. Spiritual maturity is usually expressed because of lack of faith, right? The lack of faith, unbelief is paralyzing, and it usually is the reason we see very little of working of God in our lives. When we show lack of faith, as Jehoash did, we miss out on God's desire to do in us what he can do through us. The king had a golden opportunity, but he missed it because he didn't trust God enough. He didn't have enough faith. He only shot three arrows. Now, there is a story in Mark chapter 6 that talks about the same things here, and I want you to open with me in Mark chapter 6. Jesus was going to his ho own home, uh, his hometown, right? And uh, he encountered the same response, the same attitude from the people in his own town. Re we read in Mark 6, verse 5 and 6. Mark 6, verse 5 and 6, and it says there, he could not do any miracles there, talks about, talking about Jesus, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And verse 6, Jesus, he was amazed at their what? Lack of faith. That is in his own town, his hometown. He was amazed at the lack of faith. And Jesus came there to do great things for them, and he couldn't do it. Why? Because of people didn't have enough faith. They didn't trust him. And you know what happened. They wanted to even kill him, you know, uh, later on. And so lack of faith is so paralyzing. We cannot receive the blessings of God because we lack faith. Jesus himself was there. And these people missed on a great opportunity, golden opportunity to let Jesus heal them and speak to them and, and create and perform probably amazing miracles, great things. And unfortunately, too many times we act the same way. We need to believe that God truly is who he says he is and he really can do what he really says he can do. That's very simple. We just need to take God at his word and believe it. 
Unfortunately, our unbelief, our unbelief will reap severe consequences. Just think of what we won't accomplish when we choose not to believe God. You could have accomplished many other things in your life, probably, if you look back, if you really trusted what God said you need to do. Uh, Alexander McLaren says this, It is a solemn thought that the church's unbelief can limit and hinder Christ's work in the world. <laughs> this is a very thought-provoking you know, quote. Can the church really limit and hinder God's work in the world? Yes, it can. And I think our churches are guilty of this. Our churches are guilty of this, and we need to really think about this personally and as a church as a whole. If only Jehoash had had the faith to strike the ground a few more times until that quiver was empty. If only you and I would trust God in our life despite the odds, we would have a different outlook on life. I challenge you today to stretch your faith. Stretch your faith. Our God is able to do, the Bible says what? Immeasurably more than you can ask or what? Or imagine. Much more than you can imagine. So stretch your faith. Allow God to lead you by faith. And let him respond to you by faith. So one more thing. Number three. Why the king did not uh, strike many times his arrows in the ground. I think that the lack of faith it leads us to have halfway commitments. And this is a big thing in our churches, halfway commitments. Now, God gave the king Jehoash the opportunity for complete victory, but the king was only halfway committed. He struck only, what, three arrows, and he could have struck five or six or even more. We don't know how many he had in his quiver. We must give maximum effort to God. Unfortunately, when it comes to serving God, many Christians are just satisfied with doing only a little. And this is our problem. After doing something for God, we become contented. Oh, I've done, a, I, I've done enough. I hear that a lot. If I just had a nickel for every time I hear that, <laughs> I would probably have $20 by now. <laughs> I've done enough, Lord. I've done enough, Lord. Many church members feel like they're, they've done their share in their time, and now it's someone else's turn. Now, the spirit of contentment is something that Satan wants us to have. He's actually tricking us into accepting this and, and having this spirit. He wants us to think that we have already accomplished enough, and, that is, and, and that's the way he tricks us, not to go far enough in our spiritual experience and to go all the way in for Jesus Christ. Does God accept halfway commitments? <laughs> Think about it. Does he accept halfway commitments? <sighs> this is what, you know, this is what happened to the nation of Israel when they entered Canaan. If you remember the story, God said, you will conquer the whole land. Remember, you will conquer and gain victory. You will drive every nation from here out, every Canaanite nation. What did they do? After a while, they start conquering. So they start settling. And less and less fighters were available for the army. Remember, they had a big problem calling people from everywhere. Because they settled in, they got comfortable, and they got content. I have enough here. I don't have to go to conquer more. I have a little land here. I have enough. It was to the point where in Joshua 13, verse 1, God says to Joshua, he says, there is still much more land to be possessed, God says. There is still much more land to be possessed. Why are you guys satisfied with what you have? I said, you will conquer everything, the whole land. Do you know that the Israelites actually never drove out all the Canaanites? That's why they had so much trouble afterwards. And God warned them about that problem. And they got contented and they said, we have enough. They did not go all the way once again because of lack of faith and because they got comfortable in their experience. And that's what happens to us. We have a little bit. We're satisfied. We don't want to go all the way in. Are we satisfied in our personal spiritual experience? 
Have we gotten all the way in for Christ? That's a question for you to answer. You know, this should always be our mentality. There is still much land to be possessed. There are more souls to be saved. That's the mentality we need to have. Not that one that we are satisfied with what we had. We had what we have. We've already done enough. I don't want to do anymore. We should never become content and stop serving God. Now, it's very interesting. There is a funny thing here that is happening in our lives. We always give the best we have for sports, for our careers, for our family, for our job. We always give our best for those things. And the question to me is, shouldn't we strive to give the best to God? If you give the best to every little thing in your life, shouldn't the priority change and give to strive to give the best to God instead to all of those things? I think that makes sense, doesn't it? According to the Bible, that makes sense. Can we ever do enough for our Savior? <laughs> Can we ever do enough for our Savior? In order to answer this question, we must answer, uh, ask another question. Did Jesus stop anywhere <laughs> on his way to Calvary? Did he stop? <laughs> Listen, when he was mocked and flogged, did he turn back and said, okay, I had enough of this? Did he do that? He didn't. When he was forsaken, when, he, when the nails were driven into his hands and feet, did he say, I've done enough for you guys? I had enough? When he was forsaken by the Father, did he count the cost too high? He didn't. Why? It's because of you and me. He wanted to go all the way in. If he stopped in the middle, the plan of salvation would have not been accomplished. And we would never have an opportunity for salvation. He never stopped. So why we, as Christians, stop and give to God only halfway commitments? Why do we do that? Well, because of lack of faith. Everything goes back to that. So lack of faith. We can't see the big picture that God has for us. The big plan that God has for us. So I pray that each of us will serve Jesus just as fervently as he served us to the very end, going all the way to the end, not stopping in the middle. A little boy said to his mother, Mom, my Sunday school teacher said that Jesus is coming soon and that we need to prepare to go to heaven. And then he says, but I don't notice anyone preparing for heaven. This is a little boy. He says, I saw everybody get prepared for Christmas, I saw everybody get ready for Easter. I saw everybody get ready for Thanksgiving. It's so important. I saw you and dad preparing to go on vacation. But I don't see everybody preparing to go to heaven. Why aren't people getting ready to go to heaven, he asked his mom. That is a really good question, isn't it? He looked at the way people live their lives and none of them were getting ready to go to heaven. Even a child can see that many Christians are not fully committed to God. Even a child can see that. Even a child can see that the world is more important to many of us than God. Even a child can see that we do more for the world and for our own pleasures and desires than we do for God. These are halfway commitments. I'll do a little bit for God but the rest I want to commit my life to my own pleasures. It's my own life. Unfortunately, too many Christians can see their own situation. And the situation described in Revelation chapter 3, and, and God is talking to the Laodicea, and he says, he described them as what? As lukewarm. These are those who ha have half commitments. Halfway commitments. They are lukewarm, on the fence somewhere. They are not hot nor cold. They are somewhere in the middle. These are the Christians who are only halfway committed to God and His mission. And unfortunately, there are so many of those members in our churches. I'm not talking about this church. This church is great. I mean, <laughs> I had to say that. It wasn't in my notes. I had to just say that. You know who I'm talking to today. If you're there in that boat... 
that you feel that you're more committed to the world and to your own life and to your own pleasures, you're in the wrong boat. You must come on God's side. You must fully, you must become fully committed to the Lord, not just halfway committed. Now, when we talk about serving God and doing his work, especially the work of proclaiming the gospel to others, we are always excited to hear the, the success stories, aren't we? We are always excited to see people up front standing and sharing those testimonies, how God was working miracles and how they're sharing with others. These are success stories, and we're always excited about those. And those are great to hear. It encourages us to do something as well. These are great stories and testimonies, but listen to this profound quote from Prophets and Kings, page 263. When God opens the way for the accomplishment of certain work and gives assurance of success, the chosen instrumentality must do all in his or her power to bring about the promised result. And this, this next uh, sentence is really important. In proportion to the enthusiasm and perseverance with which the work is carried forward will be the success given. So God has a plan. He's giving us this plan, but he wants us to work together with him. And only in proportion with our enthusiasm and perseverance, the success will come. It's a very, very strong comment here. Then she continues. God can work miracles for his people only as they act their part with an untiring energy. He calls for men and women of devotion to his work, men and women of moral courage, with ardent love for souls and with a zeal that never flags. Such workers will find no task too difficult, no prospect too hopeless. They will labor on undaunted until apparent defeat is turned into glorious victory. Not even prison walls, nor the martyrs' stake beyond will cause them to swerve from their purpose of laboring together with God for the upbuilding of his kingdom. We always want results, don't we? We want to see people coming to the church and coming to God's kingdom, but we don't want to put the effort. We want to see the success and the results, but we don't want to put any effort into that. We don't want to persevere in our efforts, and we are not enthusiastic or passionate about God's work. Only in, in proportion to our enthusiasm and our perseverance, the success will come. So how much perseverance you're putting, how much effort you're putting into this? Are you enthusiastic about God's work or more about enthusiastic about your own life? Are you passionate about God's work? That is the question here. We want to see success, but then we're not passionate about God's work. That's not going to happen. It doesn't make any sense. We are much more enthusiastic about everything else in the world. I can probably ask you, you'll know all the movies that have come out lately. You know, some of you. You know everything on social media, probably. You know everything that, you know, it doesn't really matter, but we don't do one thing that really matters, God's work. And so how enthusiastic and passionate are you about God's work? We have lost that enthusiasm lately. You know, during the pandemic, a lot of people have lost that enthusiasm. They have lost that passion for God and his work. And so we need to come back to that. If you think I'm wrong about a lot of people not being enthusiastic about, you know, the spiritual things, just watch what you are doing most often and what you invest your time and effort into, and that will tell you where you are at in your, in your personal life. Whatever you spend the most time, that's your passion. So look at your life. I'm not going to point to anyone's life, but you have to do it yourself to look at there. There are many different reasons why people miss opportunities presented to them. Fear is one of them. We miss opportunity because we're afraid. A lot, of, a lot of us are afraid to go and witness and, and, and testify to other people. But I can't do it. I, I, I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. We're afraid. And, and the king, it seems to, you know, when, when Elisha told him, take an arrow and shoot it, what did Elisha do in verse 16? He put his hand on the hand of the king. You know when you're afraid, your hand shakes sometimes? And maybe the king had the same reaction. And in order to calm him down and encourage him, what did he do? 
put his hand on him. This is what God is doing today to you. If you're afraid to witness, God is putting his hand on you. And he's calming you down and, and encouraging you. He's giving you confidence to go out there and preach the word with confidence. His hand is on you and saying, my child, you're okay. You are okay. I'll give you confidence to do that. I will be with you. I'll be with you through this stuff. Don't, you ha don't have to do it on your own. You are fine. He is with you always. His hand is on you. So you don't need to be afraid. Now, another reason why people are, are not uh, taking you know, the opportunities when they're presented to them, they miss the opportunity, is found in Thomas Edison's words, and he says this, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. That is a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Many of us pass on great opportunity because we don't want to do the work. We don't like to do hard work. Ah, that's too much work. And then we miss a great opportunity. And we do the same with God's work. It's too much work. But there are souls out there that might have only one opportunity to hear God's word. <laughs> have we missed those opportunities in our lives? When God is going to ask us to give an account to him, he's not going to ask us what how someone else did. Because we say, well, let someone else do it. I've done enough. When he asks us in the judgment to give an account, he's gonna, not going to ask, well, again, do you know what Jeff did? No, he's going to ask me, what have you done? Have you been a good and faithful servant? He's going to ask you personally. The last reason why people miss opportunities, it's because it's often disguised as problems. Opportunities are always disguised as problems. Too often what we perceive, an, you know, perceive an, as an obstacle, no money, no machinery, no methodology, no manpower, and things like that, those are God's opportunities in disguise, actually. But we see them as problems. And don't miss an opportunity because it's dressed up in a misleading costume and is looking like a problem. Take those opportunities. Let God work through you, and he will perform miracles through you. Allow God to work through you. Scott Fitzgerald says this, and I'm concluding now. He says, our lives are defined by opportunities, even the ones we missed. Our lives are defined by opportunities. Do you believe that? It is true. That's what the Bible says. We are defined by those opportunities that God presents to us. The opportunities that God presents to us to share the gospel, to impact someone for eternity, are just opportunities if we don't do anything about them. In the late 1800s, no business matched the financial power and political dominance of the railroad. They were the most powerful here in North America and in Europe as well. And trains dominated everything, the transportation industry in the United States for many, many years. Um, you know, they were moving both people and goods throughout the country. Then a new discovery came along, the car, right? And incredibly, the leaders of the railroad, rail, railroad industry, they did not take advantage of their unique position to participate uh, in this transportation development. The reason was that the railroad leaders didn't understand what business they were in. Uh, they thought they were in the train business, but actually they were in the transportation business. That's two different things. And they, you know, time has passed by and the opportunity has passed by them too. And they couldn't see what their real purpose was. They missed that opportunity because they didn't know what their real purpose was. And I see that comparison to us today. Many of us miss the opportunity to witness for Christ because we don't really know what our purpose is. Jesus told us our purpose. What is our purpose as, as Christians? To seek and save the lost. That is our main goal. That is our purpose. So when we live our lives without knowing what our purpose is, we will miss all those opportunities. Our purpose is to make disciples and bring people into the kingdom of God. Now, God is presenting us 
to us a great opportunity, a golden opportunity next year. Voice of Prophecy meetings. A golden opportunity for Calgary. He is already opening doors now. Even before, in the, in the next year or so, we will have a lot of these opportunities to present the gospel to people, to talk to people, to, uh, to share our faith with them. And I pray that you will not miss those opportunities. I pray that you will think about the king who missed an opportunity to gain a full victory and you'll not repeat the same mistake in your life. God is presenting this to us, and, and one of them is coming up in two weekends when we'll have that opportunity to spend time together and, and learning from Voice of Prophecy team. We'll, we'll be at this you know, boot camp. That is a great opportunity, so I pray that you'll take that opportunity because God is going to open a lot of doors. God is going to open a lot of doors and present those opportunities to us. With the upcoming meeting next year, there will be a lot of opportunities. And I appeal to you, please, don't miss those opportunities. Get on board, so to speak, all right? We, we are in a business to save souls. If you are not on board with this, it means you don't know your own purpose as a Christian. Our purpose is to save those who are lost. So may God bless you as you respond to his call and his purpose for your life. Amen.